again to all of you, and welcome to the Catholic University of America. We're, we're gathering this evening for a national town hall on Latinos and Catholics at Catholic education. It's part of a larger initiative from America Media that it called The Church in America. The initiative um, focuses on the future of the American Catholic Church and especially the needs of the Latino community, which is the largest and fastest growing Catholic population in the United States. I just want to say it's um, such an honor for us at Catholic University to co-sponsor this town hall because the initiative is close to our hearts and to what we do here at Catholic University. We are, as you know or you should know, the National University of the Catholic Church. Historically, our students have come from families that landed on the Atlantic coast after traveling from first northern, then southern, then eastern Europe and landed in Boston, Philadelphia, New York, uh, Norfolk, even Miami. Um, today, Catholics come to this country from the south, and uh, a majority of the America's Catholics of college age today are Latinos, and it's our mission to educate those students. We're here tonight to talk about Latinos and Catholic education. It's important to think about the kind of education we make available to the Latino community at Catholic University that means things like creating programs like our Latin American and Latino Studies program or recruiting students from our country's uh, native Latino and immigrant population and uh, increasingly from Latin America, creating language resources and cultural spaces on campus, dedicating, <coughs> dedicating uh, working groups to immigration reform. But I want to emphasize that it's also important to think about the ways in which Latino Catholics educate our community here at Catholic University. Right um, out this window here, you can see the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception, and what you're, what you're looking at, um, it's, this is the south end of our campus, you're looking there at the east portico of the Basilica. It faces uh, this building and Mullen Library and Shehan and McGivney Halls, and on the steps of the east portico, if you go up into church uh, that way, when you get um, to the top step, you'll see a plaque marking the spot where, in 2015, Pope Francis, the, pers the first pope from Latin America, canonized St. Junipero Serra, a Spanish missionary who uh, to Mexico and the American Southwest. Last May at commencement on that same spot, the university conferred an honorary degree on Archbishop Jose Gomez of Los Angeles, which is the largest archdiocese in the country. And in his commencement address, Archbishop Gomez reflected on what he called the second story of American settlement, um, Spanish-speaking Catholics in Florida and the Southwest. And here's what he said. I just want to read you two or three sentences. The story we Americans tell about our origins usually begins with figures like Washington and Jefferson, Madison and Hamilton. We talk about the Founding Fathers and their declaration that all of us are created equal. But the American story started long before that. At least 200 years earlier, migrant missionaries were greeting the native people of the Southwest as brothers and sisters from Florida to California, sharing with them the most precious gift they could imagine, the gift of knowing the living God. <clears throat> A couple weeks ago, our nursing students celebrated their commitment ceremony in the same basilica, and it was on the day of the canonization of Archbishop Os or Saint uh, um, Oscar Romero, and I spoke to them about how diplomacy and nursing are different ways of being called to serve. Both might entail long days and stressful Mondays, but both can be paths to heaven. So I'm glad in, that in a very real way, when Catholic University looks at the church in America, she sees remarkable stories of Latino saints standing on the doorstep. Their stories enrich our education about what it means to be Catholic and they're making the American Catholic Church better in, in measurable ways. To, to, to cite just one, the Center for Applied Research in the Apostolate reports that the retention rate among Latino youth is 71%, that is to say, seven of 10 remain Catholic when they become adults. By contrast, the retention among non-Hispanics is 61%. Neither of these numbers is what we should hope it um, ought to be, but one thing they do show is that America's Latin population has some lessons to teach all of us here at the university and elsewhere about the love of God. So thank you for joining us in this conversation and thanks to American Media for starting the conversation. So let me turn it now over to Father Malone who's gonna 
say more about tonight's event and the scope of the initiative. Father. You can clap now. <laughs> My brothers and sisters, good evening, uh, Your Excellency. It's uh, really wonderful to welcome you here to this event, this National Town Hall on uh, Latinos and Catholic education in the United States. I welcome you. I welcome the hundreds who are joining us uh, via live stream throughout the country. Um, I want to thank the, uh, the catering staff who have done such a great job in uh, helping to shepherd us through the day with nourishment. Um, and I want to thank President Garvey and uh, the whole team at Catholic University for being, first of all, for accepting our invitation to partner in this event and, and, and also for being such gracious hosts and helping to organize it. Um, you, America Magazine was founded by immigrants. It was founded by uh, Jesuits who were, of, who were first generation Irish and Italian. And as a result, um, the the issue of immigration, but even more broadly, the full integration of peoples into the life of the United States has been uh, a constant area of concern in our editorial uh, coverage. Um, we thought it was especially important uh, to make a concentrated effort over the next several years um, to examine uh, the future of the church in the United States with a particular eye to the complete integration of Latinos and Hispanics into the life of the church in this country. And uh, this has been uh, supported by a private uh, Catholic foundation for whom we're very grateful, to whom we're very grateful. Um, and it, it represents a multi-platform uh, approach to uh, telling this story, to examining the issues, to providing uh, journalism and uh, analysis um, uh, of the various issues that we face. The I think it's important to point out, as uh, President Garvey did, that, that, that Hispanics and Latinos are not just the future of the church in the United States, they're its past, and that the first language spoken in this country uh, was not English, other than an indigenous language, was not English, but in fact Spanish, and that is how the church arrived in the present day United States. Um, it is, I'm very grateful to, for the work of Hosman Espino uh, from Boston College, who has done so much to, to help shape our editorial coverage of this topic. He is uh, an associate professor of theology and religious education in the School of Theology and Ministry there, and he's director of graduate programs in Hispanic ministry, uh, and also one heck of a guy, and it's my pleasure <laughs> to introduce him to you tonight. Welcome. <laughs> Two tall people speaking now here. It's just <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, a true pleasure to be with you this afternoon, uh, in which we gather to discuss an important uh, topic. You know, and I certainly agree with Father Malone that when we speak of the Hispanic reality, we're talking about the past and the future of the Catholic Church in this country, but also the present right now. You know. Let's not forget that about 43% of all Catholics in this country are uh, Hispanic. And when we look at the Latino population under the age of 18, 60% of all Catholics, all young Catholics, school age, are Hispanic. So the present and the future of Catholicism in the United States of America is being defined and will be defined by the Hispanic presence. So one of the questions that we need to ask uh, ourselves is um, what kind of future do we want to have vis-a-vis -vis Catholicism? How are we reaching out? How are we educating? How are we forming those young women and men who will be the next generation of priests, sisters, lay leaders, parents, all those people who are going to be bringing the Catholic faith into the public square. What are we doing today? And I believe, as we will see with the panel that I will introduce uh, today, that uh, Catholic schools 
Catholic universities and any other effort of Catholic education has much to say vis-a-vis -vis, uh, this future, in shaping this future. I want to share with you a story that I used as a preface to a book that I, re uh, that I released uh, this past uh, September. The book is on ministry to Hispanic youth and, um, and young adults. And in the preface, I begin with a story about two high-level prelates in the South, uh, or two high-level um, or high-ranking um, pastoral leaders. I didn't want to use the word bishops. But uh, in, the, in the Southwest. So these two gentlemen are having a conversation. And um, it is a true story. They're having a conversation. And one of them is Anglo. The other one is Hispanic. The Anglo, uh, uh, the Anglo leader, pastoral leader, uh, shares with a Hispanic uh, leader say, saying, I am really worried about my diocese. I'm really worried because the number of uh, people, of Catholics, are declining. The number, of, uh, the population is aging, and the resources are dwindling as we speak. The Hispanic pastoral leader looks at him and says, well, actually, I thought that your diocese was doing much better. I thought that, you know, based on the statistics and the census, the Hispanic population in your diocese, the Hispanic Catholic population, had doubled, perhaps tripled. And to that, the Anglo pastoral leader responded, ah, if you count Hispanics, that's a different story. This is not a, an indictment on anyone. This is simply one reality that Latinos, Latinas hear every single day. We are not the other story. We are not a different story. We are the story. With our sisters and brothers who are white, Black, Asian, and Native American, we are the one story in the 21st century and in the year 2018. And as we speak about Catholic education, this is an important aspect to keep in mind. We're going to hear this afternoon statistics and best practices. We're going to hear about thoughts and challenges that we, hear, that, that we have in the world of Catholic education, primarily focusing on what we do in Catholic schools. So I want to invite, uh, I'm going to be your facilitator today. We're going to hear a number of questions, and we have four uh, excellent panelists uh, today. And I want to invite one by one uh, to offer a set of initial thoughts on what they think about you know, Catholic education in the United States vis-a-vis -vis Latinos, Latinas, and also to share some thoughts. Then uh, we're going to have a number of questions, and they are going to engage in conversation about those questions. And towards the end, then we're going to have an open floor for anyone who wants to engage also and join the, uh, join the conversation. So I want to invite first uh, Bishop uh, Oscar Cantu who is the coadjutor of the diocese, uh, coadjutor bishop of uh, the Diocese of San Jose, California. Bishop. I thought you were going to say coadjutor ecclesial leader. <laughs> but that would give it away. I'm happy to be with you th this afternoon, and, and thank you to uh, America Media for the, the invitation to be a, a part of this, this panel. I accepted uh, coming across the, the country from California because um, the issue of Catholic education and of Catholic schools is, is near and dear to my heart. Um, and uh, as I'll mention in a minute, it's part of my own personal story. I want to share with you an experience uh, that, I, that is clear to my mind in my memory of when I was a kid growing up in inner city Houston. Um, 
It was uh, previously a, uh, an Italian and Polish uh, community. The, the parish was built by, by those, those, uh, that population. Um, but in the late 60s and 70s, it quickly became Hispanic, Mexican-American, uh, as, as my family and many, many other families moved in. And so, um, so that's where I grew up. Sunday mornings, um, all eight of us plus my parents would uh, scramble uh, around the house, uh, sharing one bathroom and piling into what I call the Cantumobile, uh, uh, 1966 International, uh, as we drove and made our way to Holy Name Catholic Church for Mass. And we would um, drive down Everett Street, on which we lived, um, about five blocks, and then we would uh, take a left-hand turn onto James Street. And right at the corner where, where we turned, there was a, a, a Mexican bakery, a panaderia. And uh, they were up early baking Mexican bread, so we caught a whiff of that wonderful bread. We always wanted to ask my dad to turn in there to make a pit stop, but he didn't, uh, he didn't listen. So we continued on our way to, um, uh, to Holy Name Church, which was another five blocks down James Street. And I always wanted to sit on uh, next to the window because as we made our way down James Street, I wanted to keep my eye on the horizon because eventually over the, the trees and over the, uh, the modest wood frame homes that um, uh, lined the street, um, eventually would tower the, the two bell towers of Holy Name Church, beautiful Romanesque structure. And I always loved to, to see those two towers because that was the first part of the, the parish that, that was visible. And we not only made that trek on Sundays, uh, we made it many times during the week for for parish meetings, for youth groups, um, and eventually, uh, as my siblings and I would become students at the parochial school every day. And those two towers were kind of burnished into my, um, my imagination. And one of the things that they came to symbolize for me, those two towers, was faith and education. Those were two values that my, my father, who had an, a sixth grade education from rural Mexico, um, inculcated in my siblings and me. That we hang on, that we hold tightly to our faith, that guides us, that gives us the values of life, that introduces us to our God, to our Savior. And education that opens to us possibilities and opportunities. He shared with us many, many times his own story that he didn't like school. He didn't like going to school. He didn't like studying. And he said that to his father. And so his father, who ran his, his farm, said, good, I need another hand on the farm. And so there began his work career at the, the ripe age of about 11. And he never, never went back to school. And it wasn't until his adult years that he realized what he missed, that he missed many opportunities opportunities that he didn't want my siblings and me to miss, especially now being in the United States, where there were many opportunities. And so those, those two towers of faith and education that, that give us direction 
and give us opportunities. I'm happy to be a, a part of this, of this panel. Um, while I'm not an expert in, in, in Catholic education, I think I bring a unique perspective to, to this conversation uh, because I was raised by immigrant parents from Mexico. Uh, I grew up in the inner city of Houston. I was a student at a parochial school. I went on and followed my two older brothers to uh, the, the college prep, uh, an all-boys bazillion Catholic high school that prepared me well for college and beyond. Um, I had been in Catholic education for 25 years. I should have some buildings named after me. <laughs> but um, it, as um, Providence would have it, about 30 years later, after those many treks to Holy Name Church and, and, and school, um, I would become the pastor of Holy Name Parish. Um, I discovered later that no other priest wanted to go there to the inner city with a parish with such a large debt. Uh, I was happy to be there. Um, I knew many in the community that I had grown up with. Um, the little old ladies who got after me um, were still there. And, um, um, and the opportunity now to, to be the pastor of this community. The school was still open. Uh, it no longer is. So um, what I quickly realized was that the neighborhood had changed tremendously, where it was uh, a burgeoning, um, uh, up-and-coming, working, uh, working uh, class neighborhood had suddenly become dilapidated. Um, many um, buildings boarded up. Uh, many uh, homes abandoned, and so there were certainly tremendous challenges. Um, but I'll, and then, of course, eventually I would ask to be serve uh, to serve the church as a bishop. So those those various perspectives that uh, I might bring to to the table. What are some issues that concern me about Catholic education today? I am concerned that um, Catholic education becomes the privilege of the privileged, of the elite and of the wealthy. I've had the, um, the unwelcome duty of having to close schools as a bishop because there was no possibility of them continuing. Um, they were terribly in debt, and there was uh, no vision forward. So we consolidated and we tried to re rework um, some possibilities. Not a fun thing to do. But the trend that I have seen as, as a bishop is precisely that, and that is a danger. That has not been the history of Catholic schools in this country. As, uh, as Mar mentioned uh, earlier, a, a very wise intervention um, in our earlier discussion, um, that Catholic schools educated the poor and the immigrant. I think we need to go back to that original charter and learn, take a page from that mission. Um, so how do we do that? That is the question. In many states, uh, they have the, the, uh, the blessing, the possibility, and I, I consider it a social justice issue of having public dollars coming to our, um, our Catholic schools. Why is it a, a social justice issue? Because our families, those who are able to send their children to Catholic schools, are paying twice. They're paying their taxes, and they're paying tuition. Those who are not able to pay twice can't. And so how do we remedy that? 
So one of the possibilities is either vouchers or tax credits, whatever works in that particular state. It hasn't been able to, to work in every state. Uh, we pushed hard when I was in Texas. Um, it was um, barely on the table in New Mexico, where I served for, for some years. And um, I just arrived to California. So I'm learning what the, the political landscape is there. But um, even so, what are the possibilities of, of scholarship dollars? Scholarship dollars is not the long-term solution. Uh, but it, we've got to do it as a matter of justice. We've got to do it as a matter of communion of the church. Um, and also, I would say, a refocusing to make sure that the culture of our schools is truly Catholic. Because if we're not doing that right, then we have no business being open in operation. We have to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Whether students are, are Catholic or not, we can show them and teach them the marvels of the Catholic worldview. So, um, so those are some, some issues that I, um, I think are the big challenges for us in, in Catholic education. I'm glad that we are looking at um, this tremendous possibility of, of a very large and growing Hispanic community across the United States. Um, how do we convince those families that Catholic education is a possibility? And how do we convince our institutions that we need to reach out to Catholic families, to Hispanic families? Thank you. Our next panelist is uh, Dr. Veronica Alonso, Associate Superintendent of Operations for the Diocese of Dallas and one of my favorite uh, Catholic educators. And you're also one of my favorite bishops, too. So it's just a... You need to introduce me more often. I like this. All right. Um, so, I have lots of hopes to share and unfortunately a lot more challenges because I think when we talk about those, we can then engage in a more meaningful conversation. Um, so the hopes is that we have the potential to form our Latino youth within our Catholic schools. And that's important because we know that Catholic schools are good for Catholics, but what we've also seen is that Catholic schools are good for our community. And this is in addition to the academic outcomes and the economic growth that our Catholic institutions bring. They're important because we prepare our youth. We prepare them to serve others. We prepare them to live out our values. We prepare them to see the humanness in others. And in a time and world that we live in today, that's important. And we also prepare them for heaven. We know in Dallas, that the path to college in heaven begins within our Catholic schools. And so my challenge is how can I be a seat at the table and invite others to join me to be able to be a unified voice for those children, especially for our Latino youth where we know the numbers, they're, they're there. And the impressive part of that is that within a few years and as the years continue to grow, they're going to be able to vote. So a better way to make sure that we are forming these citizens to be able to vote in ways that support our Catholic values and virtues. The other challenge is that the leadership capacity. I've asked Thomas Burnford about this at the NCEA. How many Hispanics do we have at the superintendent and associate superintendent level? It's not many. We can count them less than 10. We need a seat at the table. What are we doing with our P level to prepare them to serve our Catholic students and our Latino youth, our pastors, our priests, 
our principals, our presidents, and the producers that are going to be within these schools and in front of our children. What are we doing to educate, inform, and actually ex get our parents excited about what their educational options are? I know that we do not have Catholic schools all over places where we have Catholic families. But what are we doing to educate them so that they know that the zip code does not necessarily have to dictate the school that they have to go to, especially if it is low performing? So which is, it is why more important and critical that we keep our Catholic schools open within those zip codes because we know that we can transform the lives of those students. We know the educational outcomes. Within the local independent school district where we have our Catholic schools, they have a pretty good graduation rate for Latino youth, about over 90%. When you dig deeper, what you will come to find out is that only 13% of them are college ready. That means they are entering college and taking remedial courses. And their parents are probably having to pay for that twice then because, you know, and hopefully they don't drop out. Whereas within our Catholic schools, we have the data to say our academic outcomes are better. So we need to fight to keep those schools open. But in order to do that, we have to look at different funding and sustainability models. And I don't have the answer for that. And lots of superintendents don't have the answer for that, but that's why we're here today to invite others to look at a different way to fund our Catholic schools. And we know that there are plenty of people that, get, that give to lots of organizations that support the community. Just look at the name outside of your local YMCA or rec center. Why do they give? They give because they believe in supporting that youth. So let's engage those donors to say, look, invest in our youth. Invest in our Catholic school, in our Catholic diocese, because this is what we're doing to form the future leaders that are going to then be within this Catholic community and serve others. The other thing is we also have to look at different school design models. We're fortunate within our diocese that we have opened up a dual language school. We've partnered with Boston College. We have blended learning schools. We have a Cristo Rey network school. We have plenty of school options. The dilemma is that not all parents can get there. And the reality is that we have had students in our Latino dominant Catholic elementary schools who have had to withdraw because their parents are fearful of getting stopped by immigration. So they cannot jeopardize themselves being deported. So how hard is that to tell your child you can't go to a Catholic school because we may get stopped. So when there's an opportunity to make a difference, which go vote, make your voice be heard because these youth are watching. And so I'm here at the table, but I need others to join me. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Veronica. And uh, I want to welcome also Monsignor Michael Clay, who is an Associate Dean for Seminary and Ministerial Studies here at Catholic uh, University of America. I come here this evening as uh, not primarily a professor, but for the bulk of my ministerial life, as a pastor. I'm from the Diocese of Raleigh, North Carolina, which has seen unprecedented Hispanic growth in the last 25 years. I've pastored three communities, the last of which, by the time I left, was majority Latino. And I have been a lifelong learner of the graces and the gifts that the Latino community brings to the church. I've been privileged to sit at their feet to learn from them so that I could be a competent pastor. And they have shown me the way in, in ways that I couldn't even begin to imagine. I'm also a theologian by training. I'm a pastoral theologian, and that's primarily my work here at the university. I work uh, during the academic year with the seminarian community and teach courses in pastoral theology to prepare them to be good and effective pastoral leaders. I'm not sure if that's uh, the same language that Dr. Ospina was using earlier, but we'll call it pastoral leaders. 
So I'm the person that they call the, 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 the pa theologian pastor. I try to take the theology in the sky and to match it to the reality on the ground and to put that into a dialogue so that people can understand how we can move forward and bring the reign of God more uh, concretely into our world. This is my great privilege to be here. If you had asked me 10 years ago, would I be at Catholic University doing this, I would have said, no way, Jose. There's just no way I was going to be doing this. But God's providence is very interesting, and so I'm here today. My journey with the Latino community really began in earnest in 1995 when I was assigned to the parish from hell in my diocese. I'll leave that name nameless at the moment. It had been through three pastors in six years. And one of them had had a heart attack, one of them had a mental breakdown, and the third just simply said, I'm out of here. So the bishop said, oh, I need a fool to go in there, so I'll send Clay in, and that's how I ended up there. But what I discovered once I got there was an enormous richness. I learned I would have a mass in Spanish. I hadn't used Spanish since I was in college. I learned that I would be uh, dealing with a predominantly immigrant community. I had no idea what that meant. And so the first couple of weeks in the parish, there were about 50 Latinos in the community, and we had mass. I'm reading everything verbatim from pieces of paper uh, because that's the best I could do. The parishioners were very um, gentle with me. About three months into the parish, uh, my assignment, two uh, rancheros uh, who were living in the area came up to see me after mass, and one of them asked me just point blank, Father, can we have Guadalupe in the church? And I thought to myself, well, um, we already have her in the church. She's in the vestibule. My, one of my predecessors had put a, an image of Guadalupe in the vestibule of the church. And they said, no, Padre, we need her in the church. Can we put her in the church? And I said, sure. I said, but you need to take her out of the church at the end of Mass because we have no place for her to be permanently in the church. They said, Father, Padre, that's not a problem. We'll take care of getting her in and getting her out, but we need to see her in the church. So I had no, this, was, this was, I'm flying blind here. I have no idea what I'm walking into. And within three months of them carefully bringing Guadalupe in, placing her on a, a stand, the community went from 50 people worshiping in Spanish on Sunday to 350 people. And when I asked later what had happened, I'll never forget the response. If she's welcome in the church, we know we're welcomed in the church. And that changed everything for me in terms of pastoral ministry in the midst of a Latino community. It was then that I began to realize that I needed to spend a lot of time learning the gifts and the blessings that the Latino community would bring to the church. After I left that parish, I became a vocation director for eight years, ran a, an, um, an immigrant Hispanic house of formation, Casa de Formacion, for uh, Latino seminaries coming up primarily from Mexico and Colombia. And it was an opportunity for them to become uh, integrated into the United States. What, it, what did it mean to be uh, living in the Bible Belt, where the Catholic Church in North Carolina was only about 4%, that we didn't think Protestants were the enemy. They were actually nice people for the most part. Uh, there are few, 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 few not so much, but of course they had probably the same attitude about us as well. So it was a way for them to get to know who we are and for us to size them up in terms of could they make the adaptation to being a Catholic priest in an American context. So after doing that for eight years, the bishop decided that he needed me to go back and be a pastor again. So I was sent to a parish where uh, about 10% of the community was Latino, but it was a parallel church. There were the, the Anglos ran everything, and the Latinos got the leftovers, and ne'er the twain shall meet. In my time there, it was my, my mission to integrate that community, to make them one community. Everybody was at the table. Everybody had a role. There were no parallel anythings. We were one Catholic parish. I saw many great signs there, probably the most significant of which was I got the ladies' guild, who were Anglos, because we all know that women really had the power in the church, and the women, the Anglo women and the Latinas, the, the, their, their, their group, 
were able to work out a way to be in relationship with, an, uh, with one another, and they became great leaders in the community to help us to grow. So I'm currently here uh, trying to help seminarians, primarily during the academic year, to be prepared to become pastoral leaders, not pastoral managers. We've got enough of those already, pastoral leaders. And so that means that I have to help them revision how they see themselves as priests. I need to reorient their vision from a maintenance perspective to a mission perspective. I need to help them to understand the primacy of themselves being evangelized because that is what the church is calling us to do, is to evangelize. I'm working with seminarians to try to help them to develop a sense of missionary discipleship. If they don't get it, they can't help their people. And then we give them skills, knowledge, so that they can help to revision their parish. In the context of that, we attempt to address the question of how do you do that in a Latino context. And so we try to work with issues around awareness, which is a big issue, sensitivity, which calls for empathy, and then for, again, training in the particularities of Latino culture, practices, spirituality, the family, etc. So I'm here today because I work in a field where we are training the future leaders of our church. I think in many ways, because we are Catholics, the pastor is always going to remain the, one of the key players in, in parish life, and, and rightfully so. So how are we preparing these young men, maybe some not quite so young, how are we preparing them to be effective in bringing about not only a, a, a healthy church, but also one that is increasingly intercultural? So it's my pleasure to be with you here today to be part of that conversation. I am always delighted to uh, listen to Monsignor Clay and his stories because uh, these are stories that connect to everyday life and much of what he shares about parish life also gets um, actually transposed to the world of Catholic education, what we do in our organizations, Catholic universities. So thank you, Monsignor Clay, for uh, your commitment to the Latino community and to diversity in the church. And, uh, our final uh, panelist, uh, you know, with, uh, is Dr. Thomas Burnford, president of the National Catholic Educational Association, NCEA, uh, with whom I have the privilege of working, uh, serving on the board of, uh, of the N uh, board of directors of the NCEA, and it's always a delight to, to listen to him and his wisdom and what he learns every day about Catholic education. Thank you, Hoffsman, uh, and thank you, President Garvey and Father Malone for uh, your hospitality. Uh, I'm Bishop, good afternoon. Um, so, in terms of some basic numbers, we have 6,400 Catholic schools in the United States, serving approximately 1.8 million students, K through 12. We have about 320,000 of those students are indeed Hispanic, Latino, which is about 17% of the total. We also know that there are about 8 million uh, school-aged children who are of Hispanic origin, uh, which is a large number. And we know the majority of those children are Catholic. Indeed, as Hoffman shared earlier, 60% uh, of Catholic students under the age of 18 are Latino. Um, and yet, only 17% of the enrollment in Catholic schools is Latino. Therefore, I propose to you that there is much opportunity for Catholic schools. Part of that is because we do need to build enrollment in Catholic schools. Catholic schools are struggling at this time with, in many parts of the country, though not all, declining enrollment. And yet, my friends, clearly it is not about enrollment. It is about students and passing on the faith from generation to generation. Many other good things are happening. 26 states and growing now have some form of tax credit legislation or parental choice legislation. That is a number that is rising, providing access to about 400,000 students in some way, shape, or form to federal funds, as Bishop was talking about earlier. That is good. We know there is growth in tuition assistance funding. We know that philanthropy is very interested in supporting the Ministry of Catholic Schools, provided 
we demonstrate the data, through data the value and the impact of those programs that are sponsored. And also, I believe there is great hope and an opportunity that we tackle the question of who is responsible for Catholic education. Is it part of the church or all of the church? And in cases where we say the answer to that question is that the entire Catholic community is responsible for the future of Catholic education, then we can start to talk about how do we assess offertory to raise funds for tuition assistance. And there are some creative programs even in this very archdiocese to do that. But my friends, we also face significant challenges. I've hinted at some of those with enrollment. I would also point out the statistic I heard earlier, which, which I find shocking, um, which is that 75% of Latino children in the United States are in underperforming public schools. That's just wrong. And I've got nothing against public schools. But while we as Catholics need to fight for the right for access to tax dollars that come from everybody for every student, at the same time, we need to hold the authorities and government accountable for providing a quality education for all students. But 75% of Latino children in underperforming school is, is horrific. That, that's, that's a very serious problem. And I think as an educator, who ultimately wants kids to succeed and grow, that is my concern, and my friends, that is our concern as well. We know also the pipeline for teachers and principals is weak. That is a pipeline issue that is faced in public schools as well. Hoffman has indicated and shared with us the data that about, I believe, 17 or 18 percent of uh, the Latino population over the age of uh, 20, uh, in their 20s, has a college degree. So we need to work hard to engender future leadership. And my friends, what better place to engender future Latino leadership for the church and society than in Catholic schools? It worked in the past century because Catholic schools form the whole person for success and for leadership. And finally, I always go back to um, uh, the document, um, the Catholic School from 1977 from the Congregation for Education, which defines the mission of a Catholic school as to integrate knowledge into faith and faith into life. To integrate knowledge into faith and faith into life. And what is that life? My friends, that life is the person before us. That life is a student in the classroom whom the teacher, the principal, the superintendent, the bishops, the pastors have made a commitment to educate and form and to integrate knowledge into faith and faith into that life. And so when I'm thinking about the topics that we're discussing today, for me personally, the issue comes up of name. What is the name of the student we wish to educate? What is the name of that person and each and every Latino student and every student whom we wish to educate? And I believe that transformation comes when we seek to know the name of the other whom we wish to serve. Clearly name is, it's been on my heart recently because of what's going on in the tragedy in Pittsburgh and our Jewish brothers and sisters for whom name is so important. But I think also for us, particularly amidst this time, I find myself reaching out to those whose name I really know closely to talk, about church, about Catholic education. Many of them are actually in this room, whom I know closely by name. So my encouragement is to think of the name of the person. And if we do that, if we think and ask our Latino brothers and sisters their name and get to know them and build relationship and witness and model and build that community and then invite to participate with us in this ministry of Catholic schools, that, my friends, is how we will grow. But that has to happen with myself. It has to happen with us. It has to happen at each level and throughout the entire community. As we heard uh, recently, John Vitek, the president, uh, CEO of St. Mary's Press, did a presentation for superintendents last week in Jacksonville. A number of you may have heard that from the Going, Going, Gone study. And the line there, one of the recommendations was, make sure that you ask young people 
their name so that when they go or if they go, they know they will be missed. I think that is a critical distinction for us. Our faith is not some huge institutional endeavor. Yes, we have institutions. Our faith is relational. It is person to person. It starts with the name of Jesus Christ, but then it filters through and our church is ultimately who we know. If we're talking about welcoming Catholic schools, welcoming Latino brothers and sisters into Catholic schools and providing education, I posit that it begins with asking names and developing community and sharing relationship. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tom. And well, now we got our panel assembled. Um, one of the goals uh, for this uh, afternoon, well, you know, as a uh, national town hall, was to actually give the, this uh, a national perspective. You know, so we have invited people from different parts uh, of the country to offer a. Uh, uh, there are questions about Catholic education. We're going to hear some of those. But I also noticed that uh, this panel uh, has also a very international um, uh, perspective. You know, Tom hails from uh, England. You know, we got, uh, I was born in Colombia. We got Monsignor uh, and, and Bishop from the United States and Veronica from Texas. No, so it's very. <laughs> 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 you know that was coming, no? Yeah. In any case. <laughs> Very good. So we got uh, our friends. Uh, let's listen to the first question for this afternoon. And this comes from? My name is Mike Boyle. I'm the director of the Andrew M. Greeley Center for Catholic Education at Loyola University in Chicago. My question is, it's important for students to see teachers and leaders in their school that reflect the community in which they live. What are some ideas on how to re, uh, recruit and retain uh, teachers and leaders from the Hispanic community? Wonderful. So, Dr. Alonso, since you are right, right on the ground, you know, how do we recruit Latino uh, educators and leaders for these schools? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I think one of the areas that we can capitalize in, which, I, which is very popular within our part of the country, are dual credit courses. Uh, I think the public schools have done a great job of capturing um, high school students to possibly consider entering the teaching field and earning these dual credit courses to be able to go that way. I think that's an avenue that Catholic schools have to also look at uh, and invite them to the table, ask them their names, and at the same time, are we going to them to tell them that this is an option and that this is a profession that we want them to join? Uh, you know, I'm fortunate that I've been within Catholic schools for over 20 years now, and my former students um, are teachers within Catholic schools now as well. And I would love to believe that their exposure to other Hispanic um, teachers as myself what had encouraged them to possibly consider for them to be a role within our Catholic school system. So I think uh, that's an avenue, but at the same time, I would also encourage universities that have educational programs to ask them, are they going to the communities, to the Latino communities and recruiting from them at the high school level and say, this is an option for you as well. I mean, it's very easy to say we, everyone wants to glorify a particular profession and sometimes teachers are not at that level. And I know national reports have also gone out saying how low teacher pay is and compensation, but guess what? They have mouths to feed too, they have families. So we also need to advocate for um, a just salary for educators as well. Because if we were, I believe that our teachers should um, be paid just as much as medical doctors and lawyers get paid. Uh, I, you know, and I see other educators in the room nodding their heads. Uh, we do a lot of things to serve our youth. Uh, but I bet you if we were to start to compensate them the way that they're supposed to be compensated, we will also start to see people possibly consider it as a more honorable profession and not something to fall back on or maybe that they weren't considering. Absolutely. Tom, uh, at the national level, what's the NCEA doing or encouraging uh, um, you know, school dioceses and school systems and, and schools individually to diversify their administration and their teaching force? Sure. Thank you. So. Um, 
part of what we do at the association is to gather resources, package them, and push them out. And those resources come from the field in the form of best practices and then help share them. And we have, we have a section of our website with resources for building Latino enrollment and to reaching out, as well as links to some of the great university programs that help form future leaders, whether it's the Emmaus program, whether it's work from uh, the uh, University of Notre Dame and uh, uh, Loyola, Marymount, and Chicago. So we try to promote those um, uh, resources and elements. As our strategic planning, Hoffman, you know about this, but we're engaged in a strategic planning process. And really helping address this issue is one of the core initiatives of our strategy, as is, for example, looking at fresh funding models for Catholic schools. Our tuition-based models have, in some sense, served us pretty well. But we need, we need the best minds thinking about alternative ways to fund Catholic schools. Yes, we have parental choice initiatives, but even beyond that, which is where this issue of who is responsible, where should the funding come from, is important. And I think the final piece I would say is just to, to note that there is interest from philanthropy to support Catholic schools, uh, and in a particular way to support increasing the diversity of Catholic schools and helping identify future leaders, particularly since we know the data shows that students in a Catholic school if they can relate culturally to teachers and leadership in that school, they will perform better. That's an important piece of data. Uh, philanthropy knows that data, and that should help us as we move forward. So those are just a few of the initiatives that are going on at this point. Great. Thank you, Tom and, uh, and Veronica. It's something that I normally ask when I'm giving talks to Catholic school teachers and uh, pastoral leaders, I, I regularly ask them, you know, how many of you went to Catholic schools? You know, whether administrators or theologians or teachers, and the vast majority of them actually raise their hands. You know, they're giving back to their communities. So my sense is that, you know, in light, uh, complementing what uh, you just have said, is that the next generation of teachers and administrators of Catholic schools, as a matter of fact, are sitting in our classrooms right now. You know, first grade, second grade, fifth grade. 10th grade. So let's diversify these schools and, and, and ensure that Latino children and children from the black community, the African American community, the uh, uh, Asian community, the Native American community are also there, you know, because that's the church in the 21st century. So this is a somewhat rapid fire uh, question se uh, session. And uh, so we will have a chance also to hear from, uh, from some, uh, some of you. And just uh, as a disclaimer, they didn't know the questions. So these are the questions that are new uh, to them as well, OK? Dr. Let's Christina, if I I'm might okay. interject one final comment. Sure. I also think it's important that we find ways to create educational opportunities for those who uh, could become teachers. Yes. And because of distance, increasingly things like online programs, uh, programs where students could partner with a diocese or with a parish where, they, where the tuition cost could be shared so that the person then makes a commitment to be in the school for five, ten years afterwards as part of the cost sharing. That might be another way to begin to get more uh, Hispanics trained and, and receiving the credentials that they need in order to become the, these effective teachers in, in Catholic schools. Absolutely, and thank you for saying that. Just as, uh, as a general statistic, 71% of institutions of Catholic higher education are located in the Northeast and the Midwest. Mm -hmm. So the vast majority, but the vast majority of, Ca or the majority of Catholics, as a matter of fact, are in the South and the West. There are not enough Catholic universities down there, and building a new Catholic university is quite expensive nowadays. Right. So these online programs, certainly distance programs, will be important, so those partnerships. Thank you. We'll go to the second question. Hey Hicks, a teacher in the Archdiocese of Atlanta. I teach first grade at St. John Newman School. 58% of the students speak Spanish as their first language. Providing learning activities that increase lear uh, language acquisition has not been a problem for me. It is the phonics that tends to be the greater challenge. I am looking for strategies in teaching sounds that differ from how they are learning them at home. Wow, so now we get here. <laughs> Who wants to take this? <laughs> no, I mean, 
not me. <laughs> well, so we got to, uh, no, Dr. Alonso, I want to ask you to, since you deal with this dynamic of working with immigrant families and children, so who may also be immigrants. And I'm also going to ask Monsignor Clay, particularly from the, your perspective, as working in parishes you know, that uh, uh, are serving immigrants. So language acquisition. So I'll, I'll take two approaches with this. One is we need to inform and educate the parents, immigrant parents, of how our educational system works within this country. Hmm. Because it is very critical and I, it, it appears that, and I'm not sure what grade she said, but if, first, first grade, grade, okay. But if we were to gather these students within three-year-olds, our pre-K programs, early childhood programs, um, hopefully with them being exposed, them being the children mm -hmm. to um, the English language and the different uh, instructional strategies, et cetera, her job by the time they get to first grade won't be as challenging. But the reality is, that um, there are many families, and not just Latino families, who want to keep their babies at home as long as they can. And that's great if you have a master's degree and earn $120,000 and can afford to do that. But the reality is, is, of the children that she's describing, that's not the case. So if we're talking about parents whose own educational levels are not there in order to support at home the language acquisition skills that should be there, um, every year that they delay to enter, to put their children within any school is going to be that much more of a difficult uh, job for the, for, the, for the teacher within the classroom. Now with that being said, within the teacher's levels, uh, I think ongoing professional development is the most critical need for this. Um, and this is a challenge that I would actually pose to any university program that is training teachers, is do not make it an option for these teachers that are going through the program to take English as a second language or ENL or ELL. No, no, no. It should be a mandatory course requirement because the face of our students within our schools are changing. And we need to make sure that they have the skills going into it within their toolbox to be able to pull as a resource versus having to, once they're in the classroom, juggle everything else on top of it. So if anything, it's more of a challenge if we can put it on uh, as a mandatory course while they're getting trained. And then for those of us at the diocesan level to make sure that we continue to provide them the opportunities that they need to continue their professional development so that they have those tools available. Before I go to Monsignor Clay, Bishop Cantu, uh, very few bishops of the, in the United States of America are fully bilingual English and Spanish. You are one of those, and uh, what do you recommend the people in, your di in, the, in the diocese that you have served, uh, the, the educators and the principals, uh, in, in regards to language acquisition dynamics uh, in Catholic schools? Well, it, it seems, and, and a lot of this is, is anecdotal for, from my perspective. Um, a lot of it is, um, is is just having the the proximity of, of of listening to to the language and engaging in the language. Um, uh, you know, even even if it's just a, a, a Spanish speaking uh, language home, to be able to have a diversity of of vocabulary is tremendously helpful, and that doesn't always happen. Um, so. Now, as as far as um, you know, a, a, a dual language or language a acquisition, um, where I, I've arrived to a diocese that celebrates the Eucharist in a, in about 16 different languages every Sunday, and um, um, so we have plenty of opportunity. Um, unfortunately, there are lines. Uh, that are not crossed lines of that are social economic and but we have the best teachers right next door and so it's it's a matter of of opening up those relationships uh, where uh, we have so much to learn from the community right next to us and that we have something to, to teach so there's there's a lot that that could be done I think at, at our at the parish level for our, our priests many of whom are immigrants themselves um, and so, yeah, there's, there's, there's plenty of, of opportunity in, in a very immigrant church. 
Thank you, Bishop. And Monsignor Clay, at the, at the parish level, you know, what, what are priests doing? What can parishes do to support uh, families, particularly that are primarily Spanish speaking? Certainly, I've seen programs where uh, uh, parishes have offered in the parish itself ESL programs, and especially for mothers and little children who are not, the mother is not working outside the home, the father is, and so the, the, the mother and the children, the toddlers, can come to programs where they can learn English. And uh, in my last parish, we had a gr adults, uh, uh, English speakers, Native Americans, uh, who spoke uh, to the, to the grown-up parents. And then there was another person who worked with the children so that they were also learning at an age-appropriate level. We found that that, was, that incentivized uh, particularly the mothers as a way for them to become more um, invested in the local culture. So that, that's one very practical way. Accent reduction is always going to be an issue for an immigrant. I think that's just, como uh, era en el principio, ahora y siempre por los siglos de los siglos. I think it's just, you know, that's just the way it's going to be. Uh, uh, it's just the reality on the ground. Uh, I help in a parish on Sundays where there are over 60 immigrant nationalities in the parish. And uh, the, the English is very accented virtually with almost any conversation that I have. It might be African American English that's got an accent to it. It may be from uh, somebody from Mexico. It'll have an accent. Maybe somebody from Sri Lanka. It'll be an accent. It's uh, 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 English. And so I, I think part of that is also an issue, an issue of how do we um, learn to be more comfortable with that diversity and to not find that to be so off-putting. Mm -hmm. You have to speak English like I do. Well, if I went to Bangladesh, I'm not too sure how I would do with Bangladeshi if, as my next language to learn. I know I would have an American accent, mm -hmm. and they could pick me out of the crowd very easily. So I think part of that is also a sense of, of sensitivity and, and tolerance. Absolutely. Uh, yes, yeah. yeah, so usually I you know, share with people in the presentations and my students that you know, more than 80% of Hispanics are uh, in the United States are uh, fluent in English or speak English. And some people re you know, respond to me, but many speak with an accent. And my answer is, who doesn't? You know, so it's just like, we, we, we all speak with an accent. No, I, I, I cannot replicate the New York accent, but you know, uh, Bishop Malo uh, Father Malone is there. Anyway, uh, let's listen to the third question. I am Father Luis Aldana, professor from St. Joseph Seminary in the Archdiocese of New York, and my question is regarding accessible tuition. Given the rising of tuition costs and therefore lower enrollment of Latinos in Catholic schools, should we and how could we as Catholic community raise the awareness of vouchers and tax cuts in order for parents to have more options in the education of their children? And I want to address this question to, primarily to Dr. Burnford and Bishop Cantu. So Dr. Burnford, uh, what's the status of that conversation on uh, tax uh, uh, credits, vouchers, and uh, what can we do to uh, benefit the Latino community? And Bishop, what's the, what, what's the Conference of Bishops doing about this you know, in terms of advocacy? Thank you. So um, education to parents about the availability of either tuition tax credits, you know, uh, funded by the state, or tuition assistance program is essential. In fact, some research that we recently did, um, seeking uh, to, to with Fatica to know the perceptions of those not in Catholic schools about Catholic schools. We did some focus groups, and parents generally didn't know, right, about tuition assistance availability in Catholic schools, so assumed they were out of their price range. When we told them, their response to questions about are you interested or would you consider applying went up, okay? So sharing basic information, and you know, we do this in the simplest way. Uh, every month during the school year, seven times a year, we send a two-sided electronic flyer, English and Spanish, to every school in the United States saying, send this to your parents. And it talks about school choice, it talks about, it actually talks about evangelization and marketing in school, so parents can talk about um, to other parents, talks about tuition structures, et cetera, et cetera. So there's some pretty basic stuff that can be done, and it makes a difference. Okay. Well, with regard to uh, uh, vouchers or tax credits, um, it, it, it's going to depend on the, the state politics. 
um, on what makes better sense, uh, either either vouchers or, or tax credits. Uh, when I was uh, in, in Texas, I was uh, auxiliary bishop in San Antonio, and uh, I was one of the, the lead bishops pushing uh, for, for tax, tax credits in, in, in Texas. Uh, we, we got very close, um, and, but it's, it's, it's an uphill battle, and, and, and you have to, uh, and, and it takes many years to, to convince politicians that this, this makes good sense. It's for the, the common good, not only for, this is not about um, uh, propping up uh, the elite uh, or the privileged. This is, as I mentioned before, it's a social justice issue. It's about these families who can't afford and would love to send their, their children to a Catholic school, and they're already paying taxes. So let them take their tax dollars with them to uh, the school of their choice. Um, what we did, uh, meanwhile, in, in the diocese, and the archdiocese, was to establish a, a diocesan uh, a scholarship program. It grew t tremendously. It's lots of work. Um, but uh, we were able to get hundreds of new students into our Catholic schools uh, who, were, um, who were challenged financially, um, but uh, desirous of a, of a Catholic education. So that was fantastic. So we were able to connect uh, donors and, and, and recipients. Uh, I'm already talking to uh, our superintendent in San Jose about establishing a scholarship program uh, diocesan-wide in, in, in San Jose. Uh, again, the concern that our schools become uh, institutions for the elite. And we can't do that as Catholics. So. Um, um, we, we continue to advocate for, uh, for funds that I have to say, they're not state funds. They're funds from our, fa our families, and families, many of whom want, would love to send their children to Catholic schools. Um, so I think we need to remind our politicians that it's not their funds, it's not the state's funds, yeah. it's the funds of our families. Uh, let them use it as they wish. Wow, thank you. Uh, there are two other questions that we have here, and I believe that, you know, having heard the questions before, we, they have already been addressed one way or another by, by, by your comments. So I want to use the facilitator's prerogative to ask my own question here, no? if you would allow me. And in the 1880s, the bishops of the United States of America in, you know, gathered in the Third Plenary Council of Baltimore in which they made one of the wildest decisions in the history of Catholicism in this country. They went in there and they came out saying every Catholic, Catholic parish in the United States needs to establish a Catholic school. Every parish needs to have a catechetical program, which was amazing. It transformed the history of, Catholic, of education and Catholicism in this country and put us where we are today. It, and this is a question for all four of you. No? And I will have the bishop ask, uh, answer the you know, answer last. So, <laughs> but what what is the bold decision that the bishops of the United States, mindful that they are the ones who lead, uh, you know, their diocese and their communities and their schools, need to take today vis-a-vis -vis educating Hispanic uh, Catholics? Tom. <laughs> just like, what would you say? I think, um, well, firstly, I think the decision as to what to do should probably be made with extensive consultation between bishops and lay leaders, that it's a together decision, because the work would, in some sense, have to be implemented by lay leaders and leaders of institutions. And so there has to be a commonality and agreement of, of what that is. Um, I, for a long, if I, I mean, I'm allowed to dream in some Absolutely. sense. Absolutely. But in some sense to dream, I do look at the great blessing of the principle of subsidiarity that lets a local school and parish to determine how best to serve that community, which has served us so well. At the same time, I believe there is need to look at new governance models, new structures where the gifts and strengths of laity can be used to help 
oversee the academic quality of the programs and the structures in there in close collaboration and maintaining the essential ecclesial communion that we do. And I think that's something that we should balance and talk about. If I want to dream pipe, I would like to invest all tuition assistance funding across the country at scale and get a lot more return on our investment uh, and then be able to distribute that out to individual dioceses. Not quite sure how to do that. Looking for that. Hopefully have an answer in the next week or two. Wonderful. Very good. Monsignor Clay, what would be the, your dream or your proposal? I think what we're discovering in parish life is that uh, our current generation of young people and adults are living largely illiterate lives as Catholics. They're also illiterate about who Jesus is. I am, as a pastor, concerned about what we're doing to um, change that. I think one of the issues for me, and I think this cuts across all cultures, not just simply Latino, but I, got, I have found it to be as true within the Latino community as I found in, in any other community, and that is that uh, I'm a Catholic. Um, you know, I, I remember meeting, uh, again, a, a Mexican gentleman who told me, soy un guadalupano, I'm, 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 I'm belong to, Gua our, our, I'm a Guadalupe. And, but I said, you know, are you a Cristiano? And he kind of looked at me and said, I think so. And so I found that there's this level of evangelization, this first evangelization, that getting the charismatic understanding of who we are as Christians is essential. And to the extent we are not doing that, I think in many ways we're, we're putting the cart before the horse. We spend a lot of time in Catholic education doing second level evangelization where we're training people about the, the facts of faith, the theology, and all the other things that are wonderful as part of our tradition. But we're, we've lost that sense of who we are as Christians first and what difference Jesus makes in our lives. So for me that would be, if I could uh, a, a dream, a, a, inter, a national dream, it would be that we would reimagine how we're doing Catholic education around the issue of faith, and we would prioritize first evangelization and to make sure that that's being continually um, impressed upon uh, our young people, that, they're, that they're, we create opportunities for them to have an encounter with the Lord, and that that becomes something that is personal and known to them as opposed to something that's abstract and, and unknown. Uh, so for, for me, that would be a, a key issue, yeah. Wonderful. Uh, Dr. Alonso, uh, what would be that bold decision that you would recommend the bishops uh, to make vis-a-vis uh, -vis Catholic education and Latinos, Latinas? Uh, I would challenge the bishops that if they truly believe in evangelization, then it should begin with the most vulnerable, and those are our children. So you need to invest in three areas, faith formation, youth ministry, and Catholic schools. Because if you leave it to the parish to raise the funds, then it's going to become the haves and the haves nots. If you leave it to those that show up in the pews and you look at mass attendance, those are going to be two different numbers. So if we truly believe in that we, that we want to evangelize, we want to plant the seed, then put the money and invest in our future. And I know that it, it does not sit well with the parishes that have the mega churches, and it's, that's fantastic. But what are we doing for our most vulnerable populations? And that's the challenge Absolutely. that I pose to them. Beautiful. Bishop Cantu, what would you propose as a bold decision to your brother uh, bishops? Well, um, one of the things that, that I, when I was in Las Cruces, um, I asked myself the question, the, the, um, uh, it kept coming back to me about the, the diocesan budget, that a, a budget should reflect the values of the church. Um, and so when I looked at the diocesan budget and, and, and thinking about our, our Catholic schools, I realized that there was no serious commitment there. And so I uh, realized that I, I I rarely make decisions uh, uh, without consulting, so I consulted my, my pastors because it was from their parishioners that we're gonna have to make uh, a commitment together. Can, could we make a commitment, a significant commitment to 
support not so much our institutions of our schools, but families who would love to send their children to Catholic schools, to give them that possibility through scholarships. And they said yes. And so we made a commitment in our annual appeal um, to dedicate a significant portion of those funds for scholarships for um, fi financially uh, challenged uh, families. So um, I think that that would be the challenge to to look at our diocesan budgets. And I and I agree um, with uh, Dr. Alonso that um, it can't be left up to the parishes because there's too much disparity. It has to be diocesan wide um, where we look at our budgets and does it reflect our values? Wonderful. Wow, thank you. Uh, now that we have heard uh, some of the questions from different uh, voices nationwide, I just uh, want to open it up to for a few minutes. You know, we got about uh, five minutes. No, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> no, but let, uh, no, we got we got a few uh, a few more minutes. Uh, there's a microphone over here. Any burning questions that you have? Any thoughts? Any comments? So, sir, why don't you please come to the microphone? And uh, if you, anyone else has a, a question, please make sure to, um, to come to the microphone so you will be on record and we will know who you are. No, I'm kidding, it's just me. <laughs> Wonderful panel. My name is Michael Guerra. I've been around for a while in Catholic education, privileged to serve in many different places. I want to ask a question based on statistics and before the eyes cloud over. Let me suggest I learned this from the late Father Greeley. Statistics will give you a place to look with these Y-shaped sticks that dowsers use, and then you start digging, and it's the digging that matters. And he would dig with particularly sharp implements sometimes. So two questions based on statistics. Enrollment after the council was basically four and a half million. Tom pointed out it's currently 1.8 million. So the enrollment has dropped by, what, 60 percent, more perhaps. There's an exception to that. It's the period between 1990 and 2000. During that decade, enrollment went up in elementary schools and secondary schools. Why? Is that a place to dig? Second question. In spite of this catastrophic drop in enrollment, in every one of those decades, Hispanic enrollment went up. In every one of those decades, it went up. So it moved from 5% of all the enrollment in 1970, and now we're saying, oh, Catholic schools, they're turning their backs on the poor. I don't believe that they have singled out the upper middle class Hispanics, who are now the 17 or 18% of Catholic school population. In absolute terms and percentage terms, Hispanic population has gone up. This is a place to dig. What is going on? And what can we learn from this magical decade and then from this pattern of growth in Hispanic enrollment? Dig away. Yeah, I, I, think, I think the late, um, I'm looking at Sister Dale. Um, I haven't dug deep into what happened in, in the late 90s. Um, uh, but I think, um, I know there were some economic factors at that point. But I, do th I agree with you. That would be a good thing to do to dig into that. As I mentioned at the very beginning, the Latino enrollment, the percentage of Latinos in Catholic schools has been increasing over time uh, steadily and is now at about 17% overall, slightly higher in elementary school, slightly lower in high school. Um, so that has been growing. So we know there is some sense of welcoming, but we also know that it has not grown um, nearly as fast as the growth in Catholic children, uh, Latino Catholic children uh, who, who are in the country. So, uh, and I do think you're right. I think there is much more digging that we can do. Thank you. Manuel Aliaga from the Archdiocese of Baltimore. Um, a couple of comments. The first one is that um, when public monies become available for uh, scholarships or tax credits or whatever. Uh, it is very important that we not only make people aware of this, but also that we develop the capacity to help them 
through the with the paperwork because uh, oftentimes it's really it's really um, overwhelming for for families. Uh, so uh, in the Archdiocese of Baltimore, there are some experiences in terms of. Uh, helping at the parish level, having teams of volunteers that help people with the paperwork. Uh, it could also be considered uh, at the diocesan level. Um, otherwise, it becomes really another, uh, uh, it, something that they cannot uh, really pursue. Many people cannot pursue. <clears throat> um, on the dreaming uh, side of things, I would also like to suggest that uh, the bishops could also consider, depending on the reality of the diocese, uh, inspiring and motivating the lay ecclesial movements, uh, which are very strong in the Hispanic community, to in some way organize themselves or uh, some kind of annual activity to contribute uh, to uh, a scholarship fund for, for the Hispanic community. I think that, that's something that could be considered. Can I jump in? Sure. So I was fortunate enough to be able to go to the Quinto Encuentro um, earlier this year. And fortunately, there was a breakout session within Catholic schools. And so it was great to see a lot of the people there and the participants. So I'm still waiting for the gap, for the feedback to come from that small group. But having participated in my parish Encuentro, diocesan Encuentro, um, what, what was really revitalizing was the presence of the youth and their excitement for our Catholic faith. So I would actually encourage all of us to partner with Hispanic ministries. And I know some dioceses do not believe in Hispanic ministry, they just believe in ministry for all, fine. The reality is partner and reach out to the Latino youth because they have a voice and they need to be heard. But if we're not asking them for their opinion and for their thoughts, then how do we know that we're making decisions that are going to be in their best interest? Because if we're not asking, guess what? That Protestant church down the street or another one is, and that's where they're going to feel that their voice is heard. Wonderful. Do we have any other questions? Thoughts? Over there. Can I take it from right here? Go ahead. Parish viability, you said? What is your sense about how our diocesan leaders mm -hmm. and pastors are considering their parishes' viability? Meaning, enrollment management practices for sure. the parish. Okay. Bishop. The, thank you for that question. It's a, it is a little complex, but, it, but you're, you're right on the mark. Um, and I, I think was one of the issues that, that was, was raised uh, earlier today was that uh, one of the complaints that, that, that pastors have about schools and, and those who may not be terribly interested in pastoring a parish with a school is that uh, a lot of the students are not from the parish or even if they are from the parish, they don't attend uh, on Sundays. And so they don't necessarily support the parish. So that, you know, we, we can do everything we need to do to, to help to remedy that. However, uh, I think it's clear that the, the mission of the, of the school goes beyond the parish. 
And so we need to acknowledge that reality um, as, as a matter of funding, as a matter of assistance and administration, uh, and so on. Whether that needs to be at the diocesan level or a regional level, uh, you know, that needs to be determined at, at a, at, by each diocese. Um, but um, I, 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 think, I think you're right that there, there needs to be a cooperation um, uh, between the, the diocese and the parish uh, for the school because there, there, sometimes a school can financially be a drag to, to the parish. And then that unfortunately uh, establishes uh, ill will between the regular parishioners and the school community. And we don't want, want that to happen. So however that looks, I think, I mean, that needs to be uh, worked out at a, at a regional level. Uh, between pastors and, and, and the bishop? I think one of the challenges is who is the pastor and what gifts and liabilities does the pastor bring to the community? I think to omit that as part of the conversation is to, uh, again, to use that expression, it's putting the cart before the horse. I think it's important that the pastor has the vision of what's gonna help this community to grow as a community. Again, I've, just, I've, I've done this in two parishes to great success, and I think there's something to this. We made sure that we were a community that was welcoming to all people. We made sure that our liturgy was absolutely the best we could make it be, excellent music. Um, all the liturgical ministers knew what they were doing. Hospitality was extremely important for us and that we had the diversity of people involved in those ministries. So it wasn't just the old folks who have sort of shown the t over the test of time that they're qualified to be a lector or a Eucharistic minister. I regularly in parishes, had, if we confirmed in the 10th grade in my diocese, and at, at that point, a couple of those young people were designated to become Eucharistic ministers, lectors, they took very visible roles. I also found it was important for us to be clear on, an issue, on the issues of parish outreach, what were we doing to go beyond our own borders so that we weren't becoming too insular and that we were doing effective evangelization both in the religious education programs. My second parish had a parochial school in which we did that as well. My third parish did not have a parochial school. But I found that with all that, what ends up happening is that the communities grew, the income increased, and then when I would come to the, to the, to the table requesting specific things such as in my second parish, I had a priest a couple, couple times before me who had the vision to set up a scholarship fund in the parish specifically for minorities. That was his vision in the, in the 70s. And now that, that fund is almost $2 million. And it became a second collection. And just over time, more and more people co uh, contributed to that because they knew this was a way to fund the future particularly for those who could not afford to come to Catholic schools. So I think there are all kinds of ways to get at this, but I find that it's critical who is your pastor and does the pastor have the vision to be able to pull that off? And if he doesn't, and nobody is the fourth person of the Blessed Trinity, but if he doesn't have that vision, are there people at the diocesan level who can assist him who are willing to, to invest in the pastor to make sure that he's given every opportunity to develop those skills, to get that vision, and to be supported in, in executing it. Wonderful. Tom? Can I go Tom and, uh, okay. and Veronica. And that's a great example, Monsignor, because it, in my mind, when I visit a school, a parish school, where there's a pastor and a principal, if there is an alignment of mission towards evangelization and outreach, choosing a missionary option for the parish and the school and an alignment, which usually results in getting an en enrollment management person, because enrollment management is nothing more than evangelization, really. If there is that alignment of mission, then good things will happen. And where there's an insular, protective, let's build walls to protect ourselves, then, then you see more of the conflict potentially between school and why is the school taking the money and all the other stuff. So alignment of mission, and I think you just witnessed to that one. Well, Dr. So I, I guess, Wendy, the other question I heard that was in there was, if a parish is, is struggling with their 
people in the pews per se, does that mean that it's going to then also be the demise of the Catholic school? So then at that point, we need to think of something different. And does that mean decoupling the school from the church? We've been fortunate we've been able to do that. We told the pastor, all you have to worry about is the sacraments and being a pastor. You don't have to worry about the business management, the HR, the leadership capacity. Let us handle that. Where do I sign? And, uh, you know, and so and that, that's been a good fit for that community, and it's turned out well. Um, but the other thing is, do we also then look at that school being a regional school? It's probably surrounded, at least within Dallas, uh, several other Catholic parishes that don't have a school there. So what are we doing within the school to invite those children within those schools to say, consider this a school as well? Do we need to call it something else? Do we need to call it, you know, Catholic, you know, Diocese of Dallas Regional Elementary School, uh, not necessarily be attached to a parish so that others see it as, oh, this is an opportunity for myself. Um, so I, I don't know if that's the answer you were looking for, but I think it's one of those where we also have to look at different um, opportunities that can come from that challenge. Wonderful. In some of the research that uh, Dr. Uh, Waitzel O'Neill, who's here, uh, and I did on uh, Catholic schools serving Hispanic families, well, no, one of the questions we asked superintendents of uh, I mean, uh, principals of Catholic schools serving these uh, Latino families was, do you work with your pastor or the pastoral team in the parishes that are surrounding you? And the majority said, no, we just don't work with them. No. So the first area for recruitment and to work, the first partners should be exactly those communities. And, that, and, and that's, where, that's an area of growth and improvement for all of us. Well, it seems that we ran out of time, you know, and uh, so you have to invite us again, you know, because uh, this, has been, this is, it has been an amazing conversation. Please join me in thanking uh, the panel right here. Thank you very much, Dr. Bernstein, thank you, Dr. Alonso, Bishop Cantu. I also want to thank uh, in a special way to you know, Dr. Garvey for uh, hosting us uh, here at CUA, uh, Father Mark, thank you very much for uh, your hospitality and welcoming us. Father Malone, for your leadership you know, in America Magazine. And I'm pretty sure that we are going to continue to read more you know, in America Magazine and see all these wonderful videos and conversations. And yes, those of you who ask questions, you will be there too. So that will be great. Uh, anything else that we need to, uh, to do vis-a-vis -vis the practical stuff, Nick? So this is it, no? So thank you very much. Any receptions after this? No, no reception, no wine. <laughs> well, have a wonderful evening, everyone. God bless you. Bye-bye. <laughs>